Okay, welcome everybody to uh, our second lecture in our guest lecture series for uh, Bio 113. Today we've got a very special guest, Dr. Jason Hong. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Hi, Spencer. Good to see you. Uh, so Jason and I, we go way back. We were uh, friends and I guess fellow Gators uh, back in Gainesville, Florida quite a while ago. Uh, so I'll just kind of give a quick introduction for uh, Jason before we, I turn it over to him to, to give a presentation. And he'll talk quite a bit more about uh, his research and kind of his path uh, uh, to get where he is today. Uh, so uh, Dr. Hong, he started out um, at the Ohio State University, the Ohio State University, yeah. uh, <laughs> where he did a bachelor's in microbiology. Uh, he then went to uh, the greatest university, which is the University of Florida, uh, to get There's a no master's. <laughs> <laughs> lowercase the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> lowercase t, where he did a master's and a PhD in plant pathology. Uh, and that's where I met Jason. He was doing some really great stuff uh, during that time. From there, he went on and did a postdoc at West Virginia University, uh, and then did a postdoctoral fellowship at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service, uh, which he'll tell you much more about. Uh, and, and then he transitioned from a cubicle into a full-blown uh, office there as a full-blown research scientist at the USDA uh, ARS uh, in Florida. So, uh, Jason, we're really excited to learn more about what you're doing. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, you know, sort of microbial diversity and a little bit of the services that microbes provide. And, and I know you do quite a bit of research in that area. And so I'm really excited for my students to be able to see, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, just generally speaking, what the USDA is doing uh, in terms of, you know, forwarding, uh, you know, agricultural production. And also, as we were talking about a minute ago, things like, you know, there's a lot of really other interesting research that the USDA is doing that I think most people are not aware of. Uh, so I'm really excited to hear about that. And, you know, thanks, thanks for joining us today. And I'll just turn the time over, over to you. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Spencer, for the introduction. Uh, let's see if I get this to work. Share screen. All right. Did that work? Yep. Looks great. All right. So I um, just wanted to provide my uh, outline. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the USDA ARS what we do, because I didn't know anything about it until I joined. And um, then talk about my, a little bit about my research or my story and then my current research. So the USDA ARS, um, they're just, the main goal is to try to find solutions to agriculture problems that affect Americans every day. And our big tagline is from fork to, or from field to fork or from farm to table. Um, so there are almost 700 different research projects. There are over 2,000 uh, scientists and, and postdocs, and there's about 6,000 employees. There's 90 different research locations all over the US and, and also overseas. Um, and I'm working with uh, a couple of uh, people uh, to, in some of the inter international labs. There's some in uh, Argentina and China, uh, France and Australia. And what we're doing is we're trying to see how the land and their culture practices are there. And when the climate changes or things happen uh, here in the US, can we predict what will happen with, our, with those types of crops? Um, and this is uh, a map of the different locations in the US of all the uh, ARS labs. So I did not know this, but when I first started ARS, I, didn't, I did not know that they were one of the they are the biggest uh, patent, patent producers in the US. And so they're the ones that came up with the uh, cotton poly blend. If you have stain resistant uh, dockers, if you uh, spilled water in your pants, the beads up, they're the ones that de developed that. They came up with uh, the frozen concentrate orange juice, um, disposable uh, wipes, diapers. Um, they were, they had the patent um, so we had uh, penicillin that was produced, but it was ARS scientists that showed how to mass produce uh, penicillin and to get the antibiotics out. Um, Lactose-free, if you enjoyed any lactose-free products, uh, they're the ones that created that. You have bird flu, um, 
they are on the front lines of testing, uh, making sure that our, our poultry was safe. And um, blueberries in Florida, that's an a, uh, USDA ARS product. And they're the ones that came up with the different breeds of blueberries. And actually blueberries is an up and coming market here in Florida. And some of our research is actually going into that. Um, it was before, uh, before blueberries were only grown in the New Jersey, New England area, and now it's been brought all over uh, the US. And it's because of the uh, USDA uh, research. Um, oh, and also uh, insect repellent. That was all with the USDA. So because we used taxpayer money to do our research, all these patents go out for free and then companies can use that and uh, use our research and develop products and goes right to the US consumer. So a little bit about my story. Um, I first, when I first started going into college, I uh, wanted to be pre-med. I thought that was the route for me, um, be a pediatrician, because I really like kids. Um, but then my father uh, met his old microbiology professor. My father, um, he was a big influence on my life. He was a scientist, he was a microbiologist also. But he studied cheese, uh, Swiss cheese in particular. And he ran into his professor when he was visiting um, his, he, he graduated from Utah State. And his professor said, hey, I got this idea, I started this company, and I just need some workers. And my dad's like, hey, uh, let me send my son over there. So I, I had an uh, internship at this biotech company in Logan, Utah where we use viruses, they're called bacterial phages, to control bacterial diseases. And so it'd be, um, it's an alternative to antibiotics. And um, it's been used in multiple co uh, countries. It's been used in uh, Georgia, the country that's formerly part of uh, Russia, not Georgia, US. But uh, they use these, uh, there's quite a few documentaries on it, on, on the importance. But the, uh, it was easier to get uh, FDA, instead of FDA approval or uh, food and drug approval, they went to the EPA and the USDA and to get approval to use it in livestock and on plants, it was a lot faster. So that's how the companies uh, started. And one of my first research projects there, I was just an undergrad, but they were putting the bacterial phage that would kill E. coli 0157, which is the really bad uh, bacteria that causes a lot of diarrhea and makes people sick. They're putting that in the water uh, of cattle and the cows would drink it up. And then we were getting um, the lab that we we're working with uh, out of Washington state. They were looking at blood samples. They're checking different parts of the cow to see if the, the phage, if you detect the phage in there. And I got the manure samples to see if it went through the digestive system. And as you can imagine, it smelled just as good as you can, as uh, you can imagine. It was pretty gross, but the, I was able to find that it made it through the whole digestion system of, of the cow. And uh, that was my first introduction into research and I uh, fell in love with research. So I changed my path and I went to Ohio State, as Spencer said, um, got a degree in microbiology. And because of my contact at the biotech company, I met my major professor at University of Florida where I got an assistantship for a master's and PhD in plant pathology. So I had no idea what plant pathology was until I um, started working at a biotech company. But plants get sick, just like you and I. And there's abiotic stress and there's biotic stress. Abiotic stress are what you can see here. There's wind damage on your right. There's drought, uh, lack of water. In the middle, there's too much watering. And uh, in the left-hand corner, there are um, too much, there's salt that's in the soil. So all those have these factors that uh, stop the plant from growing. But there's also uh, biotic stress. And this is where uh, a lot of plant pathology specializes in, is uh, you have microorganisms like viruses, fungi, oomycetes, or, or thought to be fungi, nematodes, which are parasitic worms, and bacteria. All of those are uh, microorganisms that can either enhance the plant or it can kill the plant or reduce the, mark, uh, the marketable yield. So in viruses, you have uh, these tulips, you see the stripes. These were back in the, uh, I think it was the 17th century in, du in the Netherlands, uh, tulip 
uh, production was this huge market for them. And they were making, um, it, it was one of the biggest uh, exports for them. And they're trying to get these stripes in there, these beautiful stripes in the tulips. And what they found out, it couldn't be reproduced from generation to generation. And it was because it was a virus. Um, and then on the bottom, this is a tomato yellow leaf curl that reduce, reduces the, uh, the yield in tomato plants. And those are all viruses. And this is uh, fungi. This is a fusarium wilt and lettuce. And if you saw the movie Interstellar, the re one of the reasons why they're trying to leave the planet was because uh, fusarium was causing um, a disease over all the crops. They had, uh, fusarium is interesting because it can uh, uh, attack um, almost every, every important um, crop out there. And the, um, Matthew McConaughey and his team are trying to leave the, the planet because the, uh, the fungus and the spores spread all over the world. And so they had to find a new place to find food. Uh, oomycetes, this is an example of what phyt uh, um, Phytophthora can do on a potato. And it, that's what caused the great uh, Irish potato famine. And that's why everyone had to leave uh, Ireland. And we had so many Irish immigrants to the US um, back in the 18th, 18th century, I believe. Um, and then you have nematodes, which are parasitic worms. And they, they're they everywhere. Um, but most importantly in ag, because uh, the these root damages, where they cause these um, nodules on there, and the plant can't grow. And those are actually egg sacs for the uh, nematode. Uh, bacteria, there, this is an example of um, agro, agrobacterium tumefaces, which causes these galls. And it's the first example of a something from one kingdom infecting another uh, organism from another kingdom that injected its DNA and caused the second plant to start, or the second organism to start growing. Um, that was one of the first discoveries made with it. And later we found viruses do the same thing, but uh, it is the bacterium that's, that's has uh, injected its bacteria, or sorry, its DNA into the plant. And the plant is now being told to start making these, these giant masses. Um, in Florida, one of the big concerns right now is uh, HLB or citrus greening. And that is a bacterium that spread by an insect, and it's reduced um, citrus yields, oranges, uh, grapefruits in particular, uh, down to the 1940s level. And um, they said some of the oranges uh, we've had these last couple of years, we've had to import oranges and our orange juice production um, uh, imported from other countries because there wasn't enough oranges grown here in Florida. And so um, it's, a, it's a huge problem that we're, the USDA and other scientists are working on. So um, I worked on a bacterium called Rostonia silenciarum for my master's and PhD. It causes bacterial wilt in uh, over 400 different plants. Uh, it's actually uh, in Hawaii and it kills ginger over there. Uh, one of the tests is to tell if you have uh, bacterial wilt is you take the stem, you, put it in a test tube and with water, you'll see that streaming. It almost looks like smoke coming down. And that is the bacteria streaming out of the stem of the, of the tomato plant. Um, this is uh, the selective media called SMSA. And that's what it looks like. It's an indicating, um, uh, is an indicating uh, media that we use, an auger. And we call it the fried, fried egg look, where you have the center that's kind of uh, red, and then you have the uh, um, the rest of the egg or, or the bacteria. Um, and then for my master's project, I discovered a um, strain of this bacteria that kills um, banana in the U.S. It's the first report of that. Um, part of my master's project uh, was looking at different ways to control the um, the disease. On the left is a um, what the what the bacteria can do in the field. So it just wipes out all the tomato plants and it can be spread through uh, irrigation water. And so uh, growers could be, um, what I found was that growers were uh, watering with, uh, from retention ponds and in the ponds there was the pathogen. And as they put it in the soil, then you build up the population of the bacteria and just wipe out the tomato crops. Um, on the right, we used, 
it was interesting. We used a uh, essential oil uh, called uh, thymol, which is comes from thyme and oregano, and they used the active component of that, and we put that in the soil, and it was able to kill off the bacteria. It has some antimicrobial uh, properties to it. Um, but the cost of, to produce a thymol it was too much, and so it's not really a good alternative for for a plant uh, for the growers. Um, so part of that research was uh, that research was uh, in conjunction with this. Uh, it's, it's called the alternatives for methyl bromide. Methyl bromide is a chemical that growers used to use um, all the way from World War II to um, to the uh, early 2000s. Uh, but what they found was methyl bromide was one of the causes of the ozone hole over uh, Chile and the, um, the Antarctic. And so there was it was first time in, uh, about 1985 or so that um, all the countries in the world banned a product. And so they banned the production of uh, methyl bromide. And so growers started looking and they had 10 years to adjust to it. And so the, about uh, late nineties, there was a lot of push to look for methyl bromide alternatives to uh, clean your soil out. That's what, that's what, the, that's what it does is it, it gets, it kills everything in the soil. And so then you can, um, it dissipates within a week and goes into the atmosphere. And uh, then after you waited a week, then you can put your transplants, your, your tomato plants or whatever you're planting in there, and it's pathogen free and weed free. But because uh, there was this uh, ban on that product, people have been looking for alternatives. And so that's been primarily a lot of my research is looking for alternatives to methyl bromide. Um, part of my PhD project was looking at the DNA of uh, different strains of Rostonia. So the, I collected over 200 strains of Rostonia in the southeastern U.S. and we compared the DNA, do a lot of DNA comparisons. I got really big into phylogenetics. And what we found was that most of the strains in the southeastern U.S. were all related from Virginia all the way down to Florida. Um, but there were pockets in Florida that were very unique. Um, and some of these strains had a, a greater diversity. And that's where I found the, the, the strain that killed banana plants. Um, it was in the panhandle of Florida. And so there was more biodiversity of the, this Rostonia strain, uh, Rostonia isolates uh, in Florida compared to the rest of the southeastern US. So that was a major part of my PhD project. So I want to talk about my current research, which is anaerobic soil disinfestation, or we all call it uh, ASD. So uh, ASD was developed as an alternative to methyl bromine, what I talked about before. And it was developed independently in the Netherlands and in Japan. And it controls uh, soil pathogens. So uh, the bacteria and the fungi and the nematodes that are found in the soil, it's been used to help um, reduce their impact on plants. Um, in Japan, it's used uh, mostly in greenhouses. And in California, there's all over the current report now is over 2,000 acres of strawberries are being used. And um, in Florida, we just got word that they're gonna be using it for most of the strawberry, for majority of the strawberry production here in Florida. And it will help allow organic strawberries to be grown in Florida. Uh, Florida is a hot mess um, pathogen wise uh, because we don't have a freezing temperatures, uh, everything pretty much survives. And so uh, a lot of your pathogens, this is a great place for plant pathologist. Um, so there's three steps to ASD, and I'll show that in pictures later. You put an organic material, an easy uh, carbon source, and this is food for the soil microbes. Then we tarp it with a plastic tarp. Uh, plastic uh, is a commonly used in most of your large scale um, uh, vegetable crops, where um, instead of, uh, if you have like a, a small garden, a lot of times you apply a mulch and it's usually wood chips or something like that. Plastic does the same thing, but it's a lot cheaper. And so you'll see fields and fields of just this plastic mulch. And what it does is it stops the weeds from growing, but it retains your soil moisture. Um, and so they cover the soil with the, the plastic mulch and then we irrigate to saturation. And so what happens is the environment underneath the soil becomes anaerobic. And so your anaerobic bacteria start growing and they produce antimicrobial compounds, organic acids, 
and uh, other type of things that control your, your pathogens. And uh, they break down your weeds, um, the tubers that are in um, like kind of the seeds and stuff and the weeds. And it works, it works really well. So this is how we do it lo um, in large scale. In Florida, the soil is pretty much sand. So we have to, uh, we incorporate um, broiler litter or chicken manure um, and that retains the water. So we do a pass with the chicken manure. Then we add um, molasses and that's our carbon source. There's a lot of sugar canes, gr sugar cane grown in South Florida. And so we have a lot of molasses. And a lot of times it, it goes to um, uh, cattle feed. Um, then all those amendments are worked into the soil and then we cover it with the plastic uh, tarp and we add the water. And so uh, because we do a lot of research uh, on the lower right hand picture, you'll see these are probes that we put in there and we measure uh, how anaerobic the soil becomes. We also measure the pH and the temperature because um, all those have different factors that help control the, the pathogens. Um, after three weeks of applying the, uh, the treatment, uh, we poke holes in the plastic and that allows oxygen to get back in. And so all those anaerobic bacteria, they, um, they, they all die off because there's oxygen in the system and they can't survive with that. Um, so here's some of the mechanisms of ASD. So you have accumulate, accumulation of toxic products such as uh, the organic acids or vo different volatiles. Um, there's also out, out competition with uh, the pathogens. Uh, so, um, you know, a lot of your pathogens are not really good survivors. You have a low pH and a lack of oxygen. And so the combination of all this makes ASD uh, a really good um, alternative to chemicals. Um, we've applied this to all these different types of crops. So onions, tomatoes, strawberries, uh, eggplants, spinach, cut flowers and cucurbits. Um, and so my, one of the things that I did was I wanted to see what would happen with the microbial community um, with when we do the ASD. When I first started my research with the USDA ARS, a lot of people didn't know that it was the microbes. They thought it was just the amendments that was doing the, the work. And so um, you have the molasses that we add. This is kind of talking about how we do the ASD. So you add the molasses, you add the chicken poop, you cover it with the plastic and then you add the water. And so um, previously what they've been doing was they would take uh, soil samples uh, transplant and harvest to see if the microbial community changed. Um, but I told them, no, we need to start taking samples more, um, more frequently. Um, and I'll show that in another slide. Um, but this is uh, the pathogen weed control that they took during, uh, um, during uh, that, that time period. And uh, so we could use uh, methyl bromide. And so all this was compared to methyl bromide. And the ASD always had a better, um, better control than uh, the methyl bromide or just as good. And then uh, yield wise, sorry, uh, yield wise, we had the same amount as methyl bromide or sometimes as much as 65% greater yield, uh, depending on the crop. So um, when I was looking at the different bacteria, these are uh, the populations that uh, at the phylum level of the bacteria that we saw. And we really saw a large increase in the bacterioides and the firmicutes. Um, a lot of those are anaerobic bacteria and comparing that to the UTC or the, the control. Um, so what I did was that during that three week period, I started taking samples and we'd poke holes in the, in, in the, the plastic and we'd cover it immediately uh, after we took the sample with uh, duct tape to reduce how much oxygen was getting back into the system. And on the left-hand side, those blue dots, that's our control bacteria. And on the right side is our ASD uh, bacteria. So if you remember this uh, bar, bar chart, what we did is we took all those data points and, and made that into one little point. And that's what that represents right there. And so that's the microbial population. So you, you see day one. So I don't know if my mouse is gonna show up here, um, but ASD day one compared to untreated control day one, there's a big difference between the two. And 
that's because you have more anaerobic bacteria growing at that, at that time point. Um, so during the whole ASD process, the three week process, we saw that the microbial community really changed. But then um, uh, by day 21, you know, and, and some points here, the, you, you see it starting to shift back to what the, uh, the untreated control looks like. So uh, during, when we take our samples, we're not only just looking at the bacteria, but we're looking at the properties of the soil. And so this is, we call, I call this the tail of two fields. Uh, field one, the pH level went from pH seven, and this is how many days afterwards. And it, on the left-hand side, you, you see there's a decrease, and then slowly through the process, you had an increase of the pH level. In field two, there wasn't much change whatsoever. And we were really concerned. We didn't know what was going on. Um, Looking at the bacteria, the uh, in field one it was a lot more dynamic, and so you had a big shift of the bacteria going from uh, day zero to day one, and it went all over the place. Uh, in field two, there was not much of a shift. Uh, remembering what happened, uh, the difference between the two in day two, or sorry, in field two, we had a we had a rainstorm actually a really bad thunderstorm and we had to leave the field. So we put the molasses out, we added the chicken manure, and then the rain came and we never covered the, the, the soil. And we had to wait about four hours and a lot of that stuff all washed away. So when we did finally cover it, uh, the microbes weren't, weren't working or they weren't, they, the, the anaerobic bacteria uh, didn't have enough food to eat. And so uh, that was the difference. And that field did not control the plant pathogens or the weeds. And so with that, I was able to show that there was a big difference, that this was microbial driven. Um, and then we've, uh, about four years ago, we, we tested this on, uh, on citrus plants, on orange trees. And we did, I did a two year study um, to see if the microbial bacteria, or the microbial, soil mi microbiome was uh, different. And we were able to see two years afterwards when compared the non-treated, uh, soil to the treated soil, it was still different. So we had this long-term effect on the microbiome. Um, and then we did uh, some drone imagery on the groves and we were able to show that uh, there was a, a difference in the growth of the trees too, those that got ASD compared to those that did not get ASD. In fact, we looked at the height of the trees and they're um, not statistically significant, but they're numerically different. The, the yield was significantly different, uh, the weight, the fruit, and the stem diameter. Um, citrus trees are grafted, so you, you look at the stem and you look at uh, the, the trunk of the tree and see if there's a difference. And for whatever reason, the stem, that means the nutrients going up to the, to the grafted part of the tree, was uh, bigger and it was better. So um, that concludes what I was going to talk about today. And, I don't know if you have any questions for me. That's, that was awesome, Jason. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think this is, uh, this is a really cool illustration. We talked a little bit in my, in my class just about this idea of the microbiome and, and how, um, you know, in, in, you know, historically we've kind of, you know, ignored the little guys, right? And it sounds like, uh, you know, in, in human health, it's been that way. We've kind of ignored the, the, the little guys who are doing all the good things. Uh, and it seems like in agriculture, that's, that's been the same as well. Uh, and, you know, one example that we talk about in class is we talk about kind of the, you know, kind of the perils of using, uh, you know, too many antibiotics or sort of using, or overusing antibiotics. What are some parallels that you see in, in agriculture uh, in terms of, uh, you know, maybe the overuse of certain practices that might, ha you know, cause some sort of detrimental, have some sort of detrimental impact on soil microbes, which are obviously very, very important. So um, previously in the 1950s, they were using um, antibiotics because, you know, that's when they were starting to be mass produced to control a lot of these bacterial uh, diseases on plants. And so even today, uh, there was, when I, in my lab uh, at UF, at University of Florida, we had uh, people that go out and see how many streptomycin uh, resistant bacteria we could find 
in the soil and specifically looking at plant pathogenic uh, bacteria. And there's still the impact from the 1950s of using all the way to the 60s. It, the antibiotics were used all the way through there. We can still find a population, um, you know, almost 50 years later of this underlying wow. anti, um, the, these resistant bacteria. And wow. the fear is, uh, okay, if you're gonna start using antibiotics for a lot of this stuff, will that go into the food supply? Will that get, get into, because um, most of the times it's the uh, resistance is on a plasmid and the plasmid is easily transferred from bacteria to bacteria, most, oh, quite, a, quite a bit. And that's how one, E. coli 157 got, um, got um, more pathogenic. It was through the changes of plasmids and they keep that DNA. Um, so that's, that's one of the concerns is uh, when we, um, another practice is used is uh, using copper. Uh, copper is a cheap element and it has antimicrobial uh, abilities too. Right. And we can find um, copper resistant bacteria, uh, these plant pathogens. And uh, it's, I did a, I wrote a paper or I, I assisted in, the, in a paper where we looked, traced these genes and we got, a, we saw how different parts of the world where they use different types of copper, um, those bacteria evolved to become resistant and you compare that gene to um, the US practices and those evolved and they're different. Wow. <laughs> and, um, so it's, it's just fascinating to me seeing the, uh, um, how the bacteria are able to adapt uh, to our cultural practices. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so what, what, do you, what do you think is kind of next on the horizon uh, for you and the, what are some kind of unanswered questions, I guess, after doing some of these experiments? Um, so we're, what we're trying to do is get the uh, ASD adapted to m a lot more uh, crops. Uh, right now, we, our major focus was tomatoes. Um, a lot of the organic growers here in Florida picked it up. Um, we're now transitioning over to uh, strawberries. Uh, strawberries is a huge production uh, here in Florida and we're working with uh, quite a few growers with that. Um, and going into citrus, uh, we're one of the first ones to show how effective it was in, with using citrus or uh, in citrus plants. Um, I'd like to come up with a, a product that uh, that the growers could use that's just a one shot deal because as you saw there, it took multiple passes on a tractor and it's a little bit more labor intensive, this technique. And so if we're able to create so a like product. So like some sort of product to replace the, like the manure and the molasses kind of mix. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I'm, I'm calling it a, like a prebiotic or a probiotic for the soil. Um, sure, sure, so yeah, yeah. Different experiments doing that. And then targeting specific pathogens. Um, can, we, can we find which, what controls that bacterial pathogen, Rostoni, that I was looking at, that I did a lot of my research on compared to another pathogen that's a, a fungi or um, a virus? So you mentioned um, you mentioned like a like a prebiotic or a probiotic is uh, so are you thinking maybe at some point that there could be you know right now you've got these amendments that you're adding to the soil that sort of enhance the microbial community or the development of the microbial community mm -hmm. uh, through that process are you thinking maybe you know once you isolate kind of the the most beneficial bacteria that you could potentially just you know treat an area with those or what's the, what's the, what's the thinking there? Yeah. Um, and so, or to like restore, or re, you know, some sort of, you know, the, you know, decrepit sto uh, soil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there, there, there was always this process was thought of um, soil health. What does it actually mean? And, um, and we're, what we're seeing is there are certain populations that seem to be, um, associated with uh, a typical healthy soil. Um, depending on the crop you grow, it, it, it'll vary. Um, but can we do uh, things with um, nutrition? Can we target certain bacterial populations that are gonna increase the uptake of nitrogen or, uh, uh, or control for different pathogens? And so that's, that's sort of the end product that we're looking at is not only just with the pathogen control with the ASB, but can we increase soil health or restore the soil so you can grow uh, other, other products. Um, in the back burner, we've got things looking at if you have an increase of salt. Um, we have a lot of salt water intrusion um, here in Florida. And so are there uh, systems or ways that we can uh, look at 
uh, indicating bacteria that can survive in that salt. And what, a lot of times we do some of these chemical analyses um, to look at what's in their soil uh, that can take a couple of weeks. But the bacteria, I can, uh, within about 24 hours, I can uh, find the test and identify, okay, this is here, this bacterial population is here, that means you have X amount of salt or these different chemicals in there. That's awesome. Um, so two other questions that I had. One was just about uh, like the, uh, you know, how does the, you know, this is when at the end of the day, agriculture is business. Uh, how is this, you know, cost wise? Is this something that is would be, a, you know, widely, could be widely adopted by, by farmers? Is this something that they're like super excited to do and, and it's going to cut costs and sort of increase, and it's increasing production, obviously. Is this something though that as a whole is, 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 you know, is there good financial incentives to do this as well? Yeah. So um, we, we just, uh, was it last year or the year before we published this, a study on, uh, with an ag economist from the UF and, um, this has a higher upfront cost um, putting it out. And that's one of the reasons why I want to create the product so uh, we can reduce that also. Um, but what they found was when you factor in the upfront cost, but then you factor in how much more yield you get, um, then it actually is better to use this product. This technique, sorry. Yeah, awesome. Uh, that's good news for everybody. <laughs> Um, last question I had is just about, uh, you know, this idea. So in, you know, in ecology, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, sort of maintaining diversity in ecosystems and, and how sort of more diverse, more healthy ecosystems uh, can almost, you know, act as, you know, can kind of prevent an invasive species from coming in or sort of reduce the impact of invasive species. Uh, is there any evidence of that type of uh, effect in microbial communities in terms of like, you know, in, in this agricultural context, like are, are more healthy microbial, soil microbial communities better at, you know, keeping out the bad guys, keeping out the pathogenic mm -hmm. uh, invaders? Yeah, um, let me take it to health real quick. There was um, a study that came out, or human health, sorry, human health. There was a study that came out about five years ago, where they showed that people that had chronic sinus infections had were dominated one, by one type of uh, bacteria uh, population. And that bacterial population killed off everybody else, the more diverse bacteria. Um, and it's the same in the soil. And so if you have certain populations are definitely growing there um, and they're not as diverse, you don't, you don't have as many factors that are uh, controlling for these different diseases or for the different pathogens. Um, and so what we found is um, when we apply the ASD multiple years, um, multiple times, you have an increase of this almost ready population that was, um, as soon as we put the, the carbon source in there, they popped up and we've had better control of different pathogens over time. Um, and the plants seem to be healthier and happier. Uh, there was also another, sorry, another study where um, they had these um, plants that were resistant to certain pathogens. And they found around the roots, the ones that were resistant had a greater diversity of bacteria. So they were sending signals out saying, hey, come over here. And then the susceptible plants that got the, the pathogen, they were less diverse and the pathogen was able to get in. And so that's one concept that people are testing out to see if the, these resistant plants, they have more um, sugars or signals that are sending out to, to make that a more diverse population to protect them. Hmm. That's awesome. That's fascinating stuff. Yeah, I, I always love when, um, I, I mean, I can just see so many examples here of where, uh, you know, the work that you guys are doing you're really tapping into the power of nature, right? And yeah. and sort of, you know, trying to harness and, and then finding these kind of bio-inspired solutions uh, to improve plant, you know, <clears throat> production. Uh, and that's that's pretty that's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. Uh, 
Cool. Well, we, I really appreciate uh, everything you said. And it was a really, really fascinating talk. It was really great hearing about your research. Do you have anything else you want to share before we, uh, we close this down? No, I appreciate um, you reaching out to me and inviting me to do this. If anyone has any questions, feel free to contact me. And uh, if you have any ideas you want to bounce off, that's great. Too. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Jason. Thanks so much for doing this. Sure. Sure thing.